I'm a cooperative extension specialist in ecological restoration at the University of Arizona. And I promise you purposely made this like super opaque, like what, what am I going to talk about tonight? But it's going to be awesome. Um, and so before I start talking about uh, what I'm going to talk about, I want to tell you a little story. So as a cooperative extension specialist, probably or hopefully, most of you are aware that um, cooperative extension has to work with stakeholders to help them address their management goals, okay? So I work with a lot of stakeholders in the state of Arizona, farmers, ranchers, backyard gardeners, BLM, government, all kinds of folks to help them solve their land management challenges in terms of everything like that. So one of the things that um, I heard a lot when I was going around talking to people was that um, there was no sort of single source, single resource that folks could go to if they had questions about restoration. There's lots and lots of stuff out there, right? But there was no one place that people could go. Arizona.edu, write it down. And it's this one-stop shopping online place for all the resources you might need if you want to do restoration in there. Okay. And so there's all kinds of information about kinds of cool stuff and people love it. And then folks started going to the site and they were like, you know what we need? We need local resources. We'd love if there was a map and um, we could click a county on the map and find local resources of seed purveyors and um, all any resource map. It does exactly what I just said. So you can click on one of the counties and you get local resources. People saw this and they were like, that's know what Dude A is doing down the road in terms of land management. It would be really awesome if there was a map that had um, descriptions of local restoration projects so that I can go and check and see what people did and learn from other people. And I was like, that is a great idea. So I created this really nice form for folks that, you know, ask them information about their restoration project. And then I sent it out to, I don't know, something like 500 people that I interact with fairly often. Okay. And I waited and I waited and these forms weren't coming back. What was coming back to me were emails that people were like, this is awesome. This, I, I love this effort, but you know, I'm not comfortable talking about my recent restoration efforts because this thing failed. Or, oh, this is awesome. I, I can't wait to see this, but I have nothing to contribute because the last couple of things didn't exactly hit the mark we wanted. And over and over again, I kept hearing from people who are like, this is something we need. I want to know what other people are doing, but I don't want to share my work because stuff didn't come out perfectly. Okay. And what I thought was really weird about this whole thing is that stuff often doesn't come out perfectly, right? Particularly not in restoration and revegetation, right? Restoration, reclamation, revegetation is really, really hard to do. So rarely do we meet all of our benchmarks, right? We might be successful in some areas, but not in others. And in addition to that, we are human. And to err is human, to forgive divine by Alexander Pope. Like we make mistakes, right? But I think a major issue in our field is that we don't talk about our mistakes, okay? And if we don't talk about our mistakes, we can't help, we can't learn from one another. Okay. We're going to be reinventing the wheel. And then we are not talking to other people about our mistakes and then hearing back from them and then maybe helping us solve some of our challenges. Okay. So what I want to do today is talk all about mistakes. And I'm going to talk about my own mistakes. And um, Alexander Pope is going to help me. And if you guys don't know who Alexander Pope is, he was this essayist that kind of famous, but he also was really into gardening. So I did some like Wikipedia, like wormholing, and I learned more about Alexander Pope than I ever thought I would. But Alexander Pope is going to help me talk all about how I messed up. And hopefully at the end of this talk, you don't walk away with being like, wow, she is terrible at her job. I hope you walk away with something like, oh, okay, people mess up. And there are things you can learn from it. And now I'm going to be a little more comfortable talking about it. Because I, I really think there needs to be like a regime shift in our field where we start becoming more comfortable talking about our mistakes. Now, I understand this is a little weird, right? Sometimes if you're being paid to do restoration, you don't want to lose clients, right? You don't want to look bad. Or if you're in research, right? You need to come out with positive results so you can publish them and then get your next promotion. So, so I get all that. But I think we need to be a little more forthcoming with what doesn't work for us so, so that other people can learn from our mistakes and also so that we can develop more of a sort of culture of sharing um, so that we can also learn how to do things better. 
Okay. So what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going to tell you all about how I messed up in lots of things that I've done. I'm going to talk to you about how I've made assumptions about what works. I'm going to talk to you about how I haven't accommodated for some uncomfortable truths, ecological truths, and then how I've overlooked simple for fancy, which is like the worst of the worst. Okay. And first, I'm going to talk about how um, making assumptions about what works and I'm not terrible at my job, I swear. Okay, so I work in Arizona. Mostly I work in desert grassland systems, which are super arid, and they're some of the hardest to um, restore successfully. And there's lots and lots of reasons, just like probably any place that you guys do ecological restoration, there's like a litany of things that are keeping you from being super successful for, with your restoration, right? And in um, arid land systems, this is just a list of some of them, right? Weeds, soil types make context dependency, when rain comes, soil chemistry, all this stuff. There's tons of things that can block us from being successful. In arid systems, however, precipitation is by far the dominant thing, okay? If you don't have rain, plants don't live long. It's like this, you know, common thing. So precipitation is super important. And this was highlighted in this um, recent paper by Nancy Shackelford and colleagues where they took all kinds of published studies on ecological restoration in arid land systems. And look what they found as you go up in aridity index. So as you get more water, restoration success increases. Oh my God. Um, so this wasn't too surprising, but it just shows something that we kind of all know, right? But something else that this study also showed was that lots of the things that we make decisions about who to put down, how much to put down, when to put down, where to put down. Those things are really, really important for driving success. Also not particularly surprising, right? So this is showing, for example, as you increase seed rate, you get more plants. Who would have known? Um, uh, as time goes by, you have less plants, things die. Um, the bigger the seed mass, the more um, plants you're gonna have, okay? So this stuff is pretty well known, but this is highlighting that after precipitation, for the most part, decisions or or the 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 decisions you're making the things you're doing on the ground are really important or are they so i did a study and when i say i almost everywhere here it's going to be someone else so um it's going to be mostly my students and my postdocs so anything you really like probably someone else did and anything that you're like this is garbage i probably did but hannah farrell was a phd student of mine and she was working on a natural gas pipeline in the altar valley in arizona which is Alta Valley is about um, 45 minutes southwest of Tucson. And um, this natural gas pipeline got installed. And what they did is they first scoured the top five inches of topsoil. So all that delicious topsoil that's got the organic material and the seeds and all that stuff, they scoured it all and they put it to the side. And then they dug the trench, they put in the pipeline, they covered the trench, and then they put the topsoil back. Okay. So Hannah, oh, and this is what it looked like. It looked like a moonscape. And this was in an area that was grazed. Okay. So Hannah was interested in understanding what restoration approaches might be important for uh, successful revegetation of this natural gas pipeline. So she had a couple of different treatments. She had this topsoil treatment. So remember, the company that installed this, they took the five inches of topsoil, scoured it all. That's exactly how they did it. I don't know. They used the machines. They scoured it all. They put it to the side. And after they installed the pipeline, they put it back. Okay. So she had just a topsoil um, treatment topsoil and seed. So we asked some local ranchers about what kind of um, native forage they liked, and we created a forage mix, and we put out native seed. And then we had a livestock exclusion treatment. Today, I'm not going to talk about the livestock exclusion treatment. That's not kind of part of where I want to go. But um, if you're interested in that, I can talk to you about it later. Okay. So this is what she found. Now, there's a lot going on here, but I'll orient you to the graph. So on the top graph, we have plant species richness. On the bottom graph, we have total vegetation cover. And I have just three things listed on each graph, which, oh, got cut off. That stinks. Okay. Well, this is the first year, second year, third year. So just this is early and this is later. And the orange, all the orange bars are control. Okay. So there's no topsoil, no seed. Then you have this little lump that's supposed to look like topsoil. And then you have these little seeds, so seeds. Okay. And in the first year after we deployed our experiment, so over here, what we find is that what I would have thought that when you put seed down, you get more plants, okay? Before this experiment, if you ever asked me, like, does passive restoration or does restoration without the inclusion of seed or plants work? I would have been like, almost never no, okay? 
Almost never does passive restoration air land systems work. And look at that. Our first year, that data goes with what I said. I know everything. Unfortunately, um, we decided to follow this for more than one year. And what we found afterwards is that there was no significant difference in either plant species richness or vegetation cover any year after the first year. So the green and purple bars that are showing just the topsoil, topsoil seeded, there was no difference, okay? So essentially what I had always thought, what I had always recommended to people, always, was that if you want successful restoration, you need to add seed, was totally blown apart by this study. Look, Alexander Pope is very disappointed in me. Okay. I made this assumption about what works because in like, I've been working in restoration for like 15 years, but that only means I've worked on what, like what, like 30 projects, which is a lot, but it's not all of them. So I had made this assumption and that assumption pushed my recommendations to people. So I was making recommendations to people that they buy very expensive, but we love native seed. I don't want to insult any of the <laughs> native seed people here, but like very expensive native seed and put it down. I always made this recommendation because I was under the assumption that you had to do that. Well, that is clearly not true. I would still say in lots of situations, you want to add seed or you want to put in plants. But clearly, that's not always the case, right? I was wrong, people. I admit it. I've been wrong again. So in the desert, um, people like to install solar panels, okay? And it can look something like this. Or often, actually, it looks something close to this, okay? And so before so solar panels get installed, they scour all the vegetation, and then they put up the panels and there's this weird dynamic in the Southwest about like revegetation, revegetating under solar panels. One, it's hard because it's it's just hard to like get in here to revegetate with machines and stuff. And then once you have things growing, you don't want the plants like touching the the solar panels. Um, and the other thing is that there's this widespread belief that in the desert, so we're talking about the Sonoran Desert, you can't seed under these panels because there couldn't possibly be native desert plants that are adapted to being in like the sun when it's like right here all day, these plants can't grow under the shade, right? I've never seen any studies on this, but this is the, the, the general assessment. And I was under this, this assumption as well. So then we did a test. And given this test is not out in the desert, it's on a super contrived place, but it's a test nonetheless. So we did on the roof of the building I work at, which um, there is, so this is kind of the roof. It looks kind of weird, but there's these big solar panels that have been installed on the roof. And we're like, oh, cool. A study system that I don't have to drive around to go get there. So under, in this whole area, we seeded a bunch of native Sonoran desert plants, plants that you might expect to be totally adapted and require the sun to be on them so that they could photosynthesize, right? So what we did is after we seeded, we installed a bunch of plots. So these plots we installed, I don't know why that says four, that should say five. I made a mistake, another mistake. So um, we installed five plots that were under the solar panels all the time. These plots were shaded 24 hours a day, okay? We had five plots that were half shaded by the solar panel and half unshaded. And then we had five plots that were completely outside of the solar panel, okay? This is kind of what it looked like. Um, you can see, so the solar panels were fairly continuous, but they did have these little um, rays of light. And that's what the plants look like. Now, I'm not going to show you a graph of the data. I'm just going to show you a picture. Can plants grow under solar panels? Like, I think so. So this, these are all the native plants that we um, seeded, plus like a couple of randos that I was like, where did these things come from? I don't know if birds are dropping them in or whatever. but. You can see that under the solar panels, in almost continuous shade, native Sonoran desert plants were doing not just fine, but really well. There was really high cover. They were all flowering, doing all kinds of things. And then out here in this wimpy land, things weren't doing so well. Again, I made this assumption based on just like kind of talking with people, looking at people, but I didn't see anything to suggest otherwise. I was making an assumption that you just cannot do ecological restoration under these solar panels. Totally, totally wrong. I think, again, it's not this silver bullet. I think that there are situations where maybe restoration isn't warranted or it might be a little harder, but this is suggesting that it can work, okay? All right, 
not accommodating for uncomfortable truths. Let us continue along this pathway of my failures. Okay, so usually um, I'm working in the Sonoran Desert, usually looks like this, super beautiful, and it's full of plants, and ah. And sometimes it looks like this. So a border wall has been put up uh, along the Mexico and US border and lots of regions. And when they put up the border wall fence, they have to take out a lot of the plant material so that they can move um, big machines to install the fence. So lots of times you need to do restoration after barter wall installation to get back some of the um, some of the plants. And usually actually you don't do restoration right here because you have to do this thing called a view shed. So people have to be able to see right next to the border wall. But um, there's just lots of degradation that goes on um, with the installation of the border wall fences. So um, one of my master's students, Amy Gill, was interested in this. And we were working in a park where an area of the border wall was installed and about 4,000 agave palmarias were destroyed in the um, installation. So agave palmarias is a really important um, native plant in the Sonoran Desert. It's really, really important um, culturally for the native peoples there. It's important ecologically. So there's this endangered long-nosed lesser bat. I really should know. I don't know anything about animals, you guys, but it's I, I should remember the name. But there's this bat that's endangered that relies on the flowers of the agave. Um, and it's... Um, economically important as well because you use it to make uh, tequila. So it's a super important plant and they grow super, super slow. So she was interested in doing a restoration study. And so actually you probably can't see it, but this is a, a photo of the area where we did it. You, you might be able to see the lines, but anyway, in this region right here, where about 4,000 of these agaves were destroyed. We conducted a study in collaboration with some other groups to install um, agaves for restoration. Agaves are like notoriously difficult for like all the people in the region are like, oh, God, they suck. But they're really important. So we need to figure out how to get them in the ground. So um, Amy was interested in looking at how to understand biotic and abiotic factors important. So what are the things that might drive the success or failure of agave restoration? OK, so. She planted out a bunch of these agaves. They're called pups. They're usually about three to five years old, okay? And then she had a bunch of treatments. So she had shading. We did not use umbrellas. We used shade cloth. We had herbivore exclusion out there. The herbivores, there are rabbits, but javelinas, like particularly like these. Um, what, once agaves are really big, like in this picture, nothing wants to eat them. They're badass. But when they're like this, they're like delicious and succulent and they have a bunch of liquid in them. So um, javelinas like to rip them out of the ground. And then we had weed control, okay? So the area in which we installed our experiment was overrun by this non-native grass called layman's love grass. Um, it's super noxious and it grows like continuous, it sucks. And we took it out in two different ways, okay? We hand pulled and we used herbicides. So those were two different treatments, okay? Oh, here we go, hand pulled. <laughs> These are the pictures I decided to use. I don't know what I'm thinking. Okay, hand pulled and herbicide um, to get rid of the weeds, okay? So this is what the data looks like. So up here, we have the number of live agaves. Down here, we have the number of leaves, okay? So that kind of tells you something about growth. And then all at the bottom here, you can see the different treatments. So C is for control. We had an agave, we didn't do anything. We excluded javelinas, we excluded javelinas and we shaded, da, 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 da. Okay, don't worry about what's going on at the bottom. I will orient you, okay? So what do you see? Well. It looks like over here, you have the highest number of live agaves when you exclude javelinas or you do some kind of shading or, or something like that. And that makes sense because we know that javelinas like to go in and munch the little baby ones. And shading is really important because although agaves are a native Sonoran desert plant, the little baby ones need to be shaded a bit because the sun can actually like bake them and, and kill them, okay? Okay, that we know and everyone's known. Not a big deal. Here's the weird thing. Over here, we found that some of the lowest numbers of live agaves, so the greatest mortality, the greatest death, was actually in places where we removed the weeds. That's weird, right? I don't know about you guys, but what I was taught and how I operate is that weed management is a central component of successful ecological restoration. Because if you got the weeds in there, they are going to take all the nutrients and the sh shade, like the space and the sun and all the resources that those growing plants that you want there, they're going to take them all. So they're going to outcompete the natives. So weed management is a super central component of ecological restoration. However, this is showing that that is actually not the case at all. Again, our little agaves that we put in had the most death when you got rid 
of the weeds. You guys don't like the Alexander Pope thing? I thought it was cute. Okay, whatever. I'll take it out for the next talk. Okay, so this is weird, right? Because essentially, before I get to that, essentially what this data is suggesting is that it's a waste, not only is it a waste of resources to remove the layman's love grass, the non-native from the site before you put it in your plants, but it's bad. It is against or reducing your likelihood to um, be successful. And that is super uncomfortable for like a restoration person to be like, okay, maybe weeds aren't that bad. But you know what? People have known this for a long time. So this is a paper that came out, I don't know, recently. And this is just showing um, the diversity or the, the number of flower visitors of native pollinators on different plants, okay? So higher is better. And the um, orange is native plants and the blue are non-native plants, okay? So all this graph is showing you is that there are times where non-native plants are providing pollinator services, okay? Pollinators are important, right? So maybe weeds aren't all that bad. So I'm not going to use this and start going out and telling people like, weeds are great. I love weeds. No way. But what this did is totally change my approach and saying like, weeds are bad and always take like 30% of your resources and allocate it to weed management, blah, 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 blah. That's not always the case. In some cases, particularly when you're dealing with agaves, you can take those resources that you were going to allocate to weed management, and allocate them elsewhere. Maybe buy more agaves. I don't know. Buy yourself a nicer field truck. But the uncomfortable truth here is that this like thing in restoration that like weeds bad. I mean, they are bad, but in some cases they're not too bad. Or in some cases they help you achieve your goal. It was like this really uncomfortable truth that I had to come into, you know? Anyway. Okay. And how have I messed up the last one, overlooking simple for fancy? Oh, this is the worst. This is the greatest sin. Okay, um, so I live in Arizona, if you haven't already picked that up. And I live over here in Tucson. And over here is Phoenix, our capital. And there is a corridor called the I-10 corridor. It's one of the only parts of I-10 that goes north to south. It's crazy. And um, it's the highway you take to get from Phoenix to Tucson or Tucson to Phoenix. It's also one of the most dangerous areas of a uh, highway in the United States. Um, people die here all the time. It's terrible. And the reason for that is that this is what the road looks like all the time. So they put the road in this area um, that to either side of it for miles and miles and miles, there's degraded um, farmland, ag land that's been left. Okay. There's nothing growing out there. Nothing, nothing. So it's just like, it's just soil that likes to blow around and cause these haboobs that make, um, it, it impossible for you to see what's in front of you. And for whatever reason, people like to continue driving when they can't see what's in front of them, but that's a whole nother story. So um, you get these dust storms and, and, and it causes a lot of car accidents. It's terrible. And because of that, there's tons of people um, associated with this road from researchers to Arizona Department of Transportation to farmers to all kinds of people who are interested in doing restoration to the, to the sides of the road so that they can get some plants there to hold the soil in place so that it doesn't blow and then cause these accidents, okay? And people have spent a lot of money, like an absurd amount of money, trying to restore these areas with like zero success, not like 2%, like zero success, okay? So I come in with a group of people um, and I'm like, I know what you guys need. You need some fancy stuff where we get like, atmospheric physicists and soil physicists and all these different people to do like um, interdisciplinary work so that we can attack this problem from all sides. And they're like, you know what you're talking about. And I was like, I know I didn't. So we try this experiment where we're like, all right, we're going to put up some um, fences and we're going to have some plots. And I was like, you know what your problem is? Because it's like impossible to get seed down. You put seed down, it like blows away in your face. It slaps you on the way out. It's terrible. So we're like, okay, the first problem is, is that these soils, these are, have been abandoned for like, I don't know, a really, really long time. Like the soils are like almost inert. They're like super depleted of beneficial bacteria and fungi and like th that are really important, not only for the plants, but for producing um, um, the stuff that like sticks the soil together. So we're like, we need to take like a soil perspective. Okay. And they were like, we never did that before. And we're like, oh, this is so fancy. So what we decided to do is we bought a bunch of very, very expensive commercial inoculants. Okay. And then we bought all this stuff 
and we sprayed it and we like talked with my probial ecologist and we put all this instrumentation out. And we're like, this is totally going to work. And I don't remember which plot was which, but it didn't work. One of these is the control and one of them is the treatment. And it was a total failure. We got nothing at all to grow out there, or did we? Is there stuff growing out there? You guys see something on the ground? Alexander Pope sees it. Stuff grew out there, not in our plots, but up against the fence. And I was like, huh, that's funny. I shouldn't have said that. You know why? Because I've been doing work for years on this very thing. I do work on above ground structures for arid land systems, because we know that in arid land systems, particularly in the Sonoran Desert, okay, when you get monsoons, I don't know if you guys have ever experienced monsoon, but it's literally like a wall of water. You can get like an inch of water in like 30 minutes. It is insane. They're beautiful. But when you get this wall of water, the water moves and it picks up everything with it. So you get this... Um, I think it's called sheet flow movement of water. Okay. So the water moves across the landscape. It's picking up seed. It's picking up organic material. It's picking up all this delicious stuff. And it just moves it wherever it wants, unless it hits something. If it hits something, it drops it. Okay. And so I've been doing a lot of work on this like super old school. I mean, people have been doing this for like 4,000 years of putting out these rock lunas or these brush piles. And essentially all you do is you put this above ground stuff down the ground and then you just wait. And after a monsoon, what starts happening is if the water comes in this direction and it hits this, it's gonna drop all that delicious organic material and seeds. And then you're gonna start getting stuff growing here and it works. And I've done this for years. Why did it not occur to me to try this in that other site? This is another thing I work on. I work on these things called con mods, okay? They're con modifier. I don't remember what con is for. Con. They're called Kodmons. And essentially, they're just these super easy little metal Xs. And you put them out on the landscape, and they're supposed to serve the same purpose. You put them out on the landscape so that when water moves through the landscape, or even wind, and it's moving organic material and seed, okay, it gets trapped there. And then you have these nice little nurseries of lots of seed. There's a little bit of shading, which, of course, is always good. So it um, reduces uh, soil temperatures at the surface. It increases just slightly soil moisture, okay? And so you get nicer areas for seeds to germinate. And then once they're growing, you have all that organic material that got trapped there so that they have all these nutrients to access to grow faster. I do this work all the time, okay? This simple work all the time. It did not occur to me to try any of this stuff at our site. Why? Because we were trying to be fancy, man, and it didn't work. It like was just absurdly didn't work. That's all I have to say. So, you know, now we're trying all this other stuff where we're trying to put in, um, do I have another? Okay. We're trying to put in um, fences and con mods, but I overlooked simple and simple, like this whole field of stuff that I work in constantly that I know that works, that is less expensive and is easier to do. I overlooked it because I was blinded by like fancy microbial stuff that we can buy online and then dig a pit and put a sensor down and, you know, and the point of this is not to like, you know, say that fancy stuff doesn't work because I'm sure there are times it does and whatever. Um, the point is, is that I was blinded by the fancy. So I ignored my knowledge and I got blinded by something else and it, it turned out pretty badly because nothing worked. And so I think it's just important for us to remember, particularly for things, you know, a lot of the, that rock work I was doing, it's stuff that we know that people have been doing for 4,000 years. You know, if people have been doing it for 4,000 years, it probably works. I don't know. But I overlooked the simple for fancy and it was to my detriment. Okay. Okay. That's, that's actually all I have. So if you take anything from this talk, again, I hope it's not that I'm terrible at my job because I'm, I'm kind of okay at it. But the point is, is that I make mistakes all the time. And all these mistakes were totally preventable if I wasn't blinded by fancy things or if I was a little more open-minded about things that would work, okay? Or if I did more tests or if I talked to other people, but I didn't, I made that mistake. So I won't make that mistake again, right? And hopefully you guys won't make those mistakes because you just heard me talk about them. And that is why we need to become a little more open as a field in talking about things that didn't work, okay? None of us are perfect. And also restoration and reclamation is extremely hard. We're never going to get it 100% all the time, ever, okay? So it doesn't mean anything bad about us or about our abilities. 
It just means that you had to learn something else. And if you share with other people, you're more likely to get that knowledge so you can make it better for the next time. Okay? That's all I got. Thank you. Are there any questions? Oh, before I, I go on, I just want to prep you all. I'm going to be here tomorrow morning. And guess what's going to happen? We're all going to share. Okay? I'm going to stand here uncomfortably if I have to. And I'm going to ask people to share their own stories. Okay? And you could share it about your friend, Steve, if you, if you want. But be ready because that's what's happening tomorrow morning. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Yes. Uh, the question was how long were, was the scraped five, set, uh, five inches of topsoil held before they re put it on? It was about a year. Yeah. Love pimples. Love me some pimples. Yes. So, um, the one thing that has stayed consistent throughout everything I've ever done is that the more heterogeneity you have, the better. Now I am also coming from a place that very often I'm working in these super degraded landscapes where getting anything to grow is like seen as a win, even if it's a non-native, because you just need stuff holding onto the soil first. Obviously that's not the goal. The ultimate goal is something else. So, you know, we've worked with divots. Have you heard of ramps? So there's this, um, thing run by the USGS that's called ramps. The R stands for restoration. <laughs> The S, I don't remember what the rest of it stands for, but it's USGS ramps. If you put that into Google, you'll get to it. Anyway, the point of it is we have this coordinated, um, and, and this has to do with your question, I promise. We have this coordinated um, set of studies. I think there's 27 now. They're all over the Southwest, and it's the exact same, very, very large scale experiment. We're testing the same stuff, and we want to see what, oper and it's across already gradients. We want to see what works across all sites and et cetera, et cetera. One of the things we're checking, so we're checking the con mods, we're checking all kinds of things. We're checking divots and divots always, always works because particularly in the arid Southwest, when you have any sort of divot in the ground, that's where not only water will collect. So it's, it's, um, so in which sure it maintains higher for longer periods of time, but you also get the collection of the organic material and the seeds. And usually, even if it's a really small divot, you get slight shading, which also increases um, soil moisture. So adding heterogeneity on, onto a landscape, I think is a really, really good way to go. Anyone else? Yes. So going back to the questionnaire, were there any responses? I got probably like three and I sent out 500. So I probably got back emails of people that are like, this is great. I don't want to do it. Probably like 50 of those e emails. And then the rest of the people were like, at least Gornish not interested to leave. <laughs> any, any other thoughts additionally as far as how to get different individuals within the environmental community to collaborate? Yeah, that's a great question. So in um, there's a lot of organizations that are doing this thing. So like the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, for example, I don't know if it's in the South or just the Southwest, but they have this thing called Seacast, which is, I don't remember what it sounds for either, but it's, it's U.S. Fish and Wildlife Seacast. And it's a, um, what they do is that they find people who have done restoration reclamation, they interview them and then they get like a little blog about it. And it's all this information of like, what were your goals? Tell me about the site, what worked, what didn't, blah, blah, blah. And then you could go onto a map and it's all kinds of stuff. It's riparian, it's, I don't know if they have much reclamation, but it's, it, and it's exactly that. And so, and I've known about efforts like that in, they had one in like Orange County, California, and there was one in like the Northeast. So there's people doing it here and there, but I don't know anyone that's doing like a, a nationwide folks. It's, it's pretty expensive They have to pay students to like do, to like find people and then interview them. So it's like, who, who is the money to do? I mean, U.S. Fish and Wildlife, I guess, but there's no grants to do this kind of thing. Most of Eco Restore, I like created based on like the, you know, last bits of money from other grants. It's like a really hard thing to fund, but it's super important, right? Yeah. Is there someone back there? No. Yes. I love weird questions. That is not a weird question. That's a brilliant question. And yes, so the question was, you know, this whole thing with the, 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 the solar panels, obviously the plants were doing really well under it. Very likely because the soil surface, the temperatures were lower and the soil moisture was able to maintain. There is a whole like field of research. It's called agrovoltaics and it is growing food under solar panels. 
and it works. And the the in in the Sonoran Desert anyway, you can have three times the production under solar panel with the exact same inputs. And there's some people in um, Flagstaff that are doing so. Um, they're growing bio crusts under those things, and then they're putting that back out. So bio crusts are really important for holding onto the soil and for inoculating the soil. So brilliant, and people are doing it. And if you're into it, there's people doing it. Yeah. Yes. Oh yeah. I probably, probably should have mentioned that. So the question is that weird study where we removed the weeds and the agave did so poorly. What happened? That was an excellent question. So two things. When you don't have the weeds, the agave are much easier to find by the um, javelina. So there was way more javelina damage. And without the weeds, so the 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 weeds were um, something called layman's love grass. It's really tall grass. And the agaves are really small. So they were actually acting as shade from the sun. So we were noticing way more herbivory on the areas where we took the weeds and way more um, like sun damage. So it's like you can measure sun damage on these things. You know, we didn't measure that. That's a great, um, that's certainly a possibility. We didn't measure that. So maybe it is, yeah, absolutely not. So the question was about anecdotal evidence and how do you, so, so people on the field know way more about what's going on than almost anyone else, right? Um, but how for those people on the field, whether it's people who are paid to be out there or people who work out there or people who recreate out there or camp out there or whatever, how do you get those people to record the information, this huge cache of information that they have um, so that we can leverage it to, to build better restoration? And I don't know the answer to that. So the way I do it personally is just cooperative extension because it's the best job in the world. I actually am like the bridge between research and application. And so I talk to a lot of the people who have the anecdotal evidence, and then I facilitate events where people can share these kinds of things, or I collect data and surveys or do this kind of thing. And then I share that with some of the restoration researchers. Um, but beyond that, I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I think events like this where people are talking and sharing are really important. Um, but I don't, I don't know. I mean, most of the um, folks I work with that are non-researchers, I'm always like, write me a blog post. Like, let's get this information out here. And the people understandably are like, I do not have time for that. Or I'm not going to get paid for that. I'm not going to do it. And I'm like, I get it. Um, it's a hard nut to crack. Um, I think also there's a, um, there's a need to get people in academia who often are doing some of the formal testing of these kinds of things to understand the value of people on the ground because often academia is like, oh, I'm just gonna like test the restoration thing and I don't actually care like what happens afterwards because th they're not trained to care and they're not rewarded to care. So also getting them because when when you when you get the people who are conducting the research or the, some of the formal research anyway, and ostensibly getting out to the masses, even though they don't, like if you get them to care, then they will start doing things like showing up to um uh, uh, man more management relevant meetings or actually going out and talking to some people in the field. And then you can get more of that like two-way flow of information. Anything else? Yes. So the question is, do I think it's changing this, this getting academic research kind of more relevant, I guess, to the field? And I would also agree that it's getting better. And I think part of it is that a lot of academic grants now like force you to be interdisciplinary and force you to have something called like a broader impact. Like what is the value of this outside of your lab? And so people are like, oh, like this has to matter outside of my lab. I shouldn't make fun of these people, but um, I'm one of them. So I, I can't, but I'm in, I'm in academia. But um, so people are like, oh, like I have to think about like how the, I'm not going to just do an experiment, write it up into a journal that nobody reads and then then I'm done. It's like, maybe I should attend a manager meeting and present my work. Maybe I should write a blog post for a special issue, a special interest magazine, maybe this and this and this. And so I think it's almost being forced on through the, the, the granting agencies. I mean, even like NSF who they don't actually care about anything applied, or that's my opinion. They have these, these things in there where you have to write the broader impacts or the, the like utility on the ground. And so it's forcing people to think about it. Any other questions? I hope you all spend the rest of your evening thinking about the failures of your friend Steve so that you can come back tomorrow morning because I'm going to ask you, and if nobody says anything, I'm just going to stand up here and stare and it's going to be super awkward for everyone involved. Okay? Thank you very much.